This is James Lutton. I'm delighted to be joined with the cat, Glenn Catley. Glenn, how are you, mate? Yeah, really, really well, thank you. So, uh, weather's a bit crucial outside, it's a bit, bit on turmoil getting here, but yeah, all good, all good. That's it, we got here in the end. Um, tonight, big event here up in Cannock Premier Suite with Scott Murray. He's presenting an evening of uh, a lot of fighters, all that you, your weight when you fought yourself and one of your former opponents, Richie Whittle. We've got Nigel Ben, Steve Collins, Michael Watson as well. So we're in for a really good night tonight. Um, first of all, these sorts of events, have you done many of these and do you enjoy these after you fight and get that day? I've done a few of these. I don't, don't do so many these days, but I, I want to make this clear. I'm, I'm, I'm honoured to be invited to come along tonight because I, I'm not class, I don't classify myself as, as, as a legend. You know, Steve Collins, Nigel Ben, yeah, they're household names and Richie Woodall. I'm not on their level, to be honest, but I'm honoured to be here and uh, really just looking forward to a, a great night and, and cashing up with some, some old opponents and also some old friends. You mentioned, obviously, these guys, you don't feel you, you're in the same bracket as those guys. I can see the smile on your face. You're, you know, like you say, you're very pleased to be here, very honoured to be asked to come here. What's it like for you to do this with these guys? It's, it's an honour. It's a pleasure to be in their company as everybody else is going to say the same thing tonight. Um, you know, when I was invited by Mark Jateways, uh, he said, look, we've spoken to Scott. Scott would like to come along in a 10 evening. Well, I, was, I was blown away. But uh, I, I don't do so many of these sort of events. And, uh, yeah, it's just an honour to be here. And, like I said, I'm really looking forward to catching up, not only with some old opponents, but some, some good friends. I've mentioned Richie Woodall. He is here tonight as well, one of your former opponents. Yeah. You took that fight on very short notice, and there was a lot of other situations going on in the background. I believe he was looking to retire at the time, and then this fight came up, and I think about 11 days' notice. Talk to me about the build-up to that fight, first of all. I mean, go back a little bit before the uh, Richie Wilder fight. I, I beat Neville Brown January 98, January 17, to win the British middleweight title, and I was never given an opportunity to defend it. Now, when I won the British title, it actually put me in debt to win that fight, you know? And people think, well, what? it did. It put me in debt to win that fight. I got paid seven grand, but out of that, said you got to give the manager 25%, board tax, sanction fees, then you got to pay your own tax. I was lucky to clear three grand for that fight, if I was lucky. And I've had to borrow money for, off the bank to, to enable me to train for 14 weeks to pay for me, you know, to, I had a young child, to, to pay and get by like we all have to do. So consequently, that three grand, it never even paid my debts. It put me in debt to win the British title. And then after winning it, I never got the chance. I was never offered the opportunity to defend it. And I was working in a sweet shop in Bristol, on the outskirts of Bristol, kicking out kids for nicking Mars bars, cans of coke, and packages of chewing gums. And I can remember phoning up Sammy or my manager to say, Chris, look, I've had enough. The game's a joke. British champion, uh, the last fight to win it put me in debt. Come and, get, come and get the belt, but he never answered. And then literally the weekend went by on the Monday, he phoned me up with the offer from Frank Warren to fight Richie Woodall. And, well, when is it? 11 days time. I haven't been in the gym properly for eight months. I still do me runs two or three times a week, but as you can appreciate, there's a massive void between being like 12 world championship, 12 round fighting fit and, and, and standard fit. And there's a massive difference. But listen, I took the fight with short notice. Nobody expected me to win the fight. And uh, I went up there, I'd give it me all. I had nothing to lose, everything to gain. Um, and well, I, I, it was noted as a back at back in the day as one of the biggest controversies in recent years. And uh, even Richie Woodall, when the final bell rang, he was man enough to put his hands on my shoulder, bent, went down and said, "Listen, well done, kid. You're the new world champ." He said that ring apron in front of his live Sky television audience as well. And you know, it takes guts to do that. Um, I did win the fight that night, as far as I'm concerned, but didn't get the decision. But in retrospect, all I really did was gain and defeat because it sort of elevated me then, it got me recognised. We was then given the WBC into, uh, IBF Intercontinental title, the WBO Intercontinental. We, we were offered a few more championship fights, which we took and we, we managed to win. But um, I think what was happening, that Frank Warren was trying to build me up, get my profile up again, because I think he was wanting me to fight Joe Kawasaki, which, listen, I, first of all, I'm, I'm not a super middleweight. I'm a middleweight. I'm five foot eight and a half. I'm a middleweight. We wanted to pursue the WBC route because that's where I was ranked. That's where I knew my best chance of winning world title was going to be at for the WBC title. And then the guy that took the title off of Richie Wood or eventually Marcus Byer, who sadly passed away a few years back, I uh, I was nominated by beating. I'd be, I, had, I was had to fight Eric Lucas for a final eliminator in Canada, December '99. And then I got my opportunity then to, to face Marcus Byer for the WBC role, world title, made a six two thousand Frankfurt, Germany, and 
12 rounds, like I say, it all come good. I probably caught him one of the best rounds I've ever thrown in my life. And he went down and, yeah, the right was on the wall from then on, to be honest. You mentioned obviously you did get to the world title. That you obviously craved as a professional and you won that. And you was, you know, you're now in history books, former world champion. Yeah. No one could take that away from you. But immediately after the Richie Woodall fight, even Richie says you won that fight. Do you feel bitter? Do you still consider and contemplate retirement at that stage? Absolutely, absolutely. You, you, when you dedicate your life to a sport, and then you, 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 and I did. I, I want the best. I was never. I never confessed be the most naturally gifted or the most naturally talented. But never far from it. Like five foot eight and a half, a blown up middleweight. I took the fight with eleven days later. One, one. So when I didn't get the decision, it did leave me a bit disillusioned with the sport and. Um, yeah, you, you you start thinking to yourself, you know, I've, you know, you've won it, and it wasn't even close, to be honest. It was a, it was um, it was an awful decision on the night for the judges. Why they, well, the, <laughs> I'm not going to say they get. We know how the game works, you know. Glenn Kelly was meant to go up and give a good account of himself, but not win the fight. But that's what I did on the night. I went up very confident, and I beat Richie Woodall fair and square, but didn't get the decision. But as I said. I don't want to talk all negative. All I did really was gain and defeat because it elevated me, my profile. It got me recognised as, as a name, if you like. And then we, I vacated the British title, stepped up the super middleweight. But even when I won the world title, in retrospect, I wasn't a super middleweight fighter. Again, look, I'm five for eight and I'm looking up at you. You know, you're not the biggest guy. But um, it all came good in the end. I took the fight with very short notice. And uh, sorry, I, t I took the fight with Marcus Bowe because well, I said I took the fight. I I, I earned the fight because I beat Eric Lucas for the final eliminator, and then yeah, made a sixty thousand. It's a it's a it's a night that I will never forget, and a, and a memory I will take to the grave with me. I was going to ask you what was your career highlight, but I think you've already answered that question with that night against Bayer. Um, but talk to me fast a little bit in terms of retirement. We know a lot of fighters struggle to retire. Boxing's all they know. When you did finally retire, how hard was that for you? You know, well, for, I knew when it was when it was it was enough. You know, you just, all of a sudden you get into your mid to late thirties, and all of a sudden you can't do the things that you could in your twenties. You know, and what used to take you a, a couple of days to, to overcome an injury or a little niggle, now taking a three or four, you know, five weeks. You know, when it's enough's enough. Your timing's out. You, um, I, I, I'll be, I'll be honest. You know, I retired. And then a couple of years back, I was, I mean, I made no money from boxing. Everybody thinks Glenn Catley, world champion, four world championship fights, two European, British middleweight champion, WBC international champion, IBF, WBO Intercon, the little champ. I, there was premiership football players earning more money in one week than I earned in my 17 years as a professional boxer. I earned no money from boxing. Everybody's, everybody thinks, boy, I made no money from this. Very, very few that do. And... Um, I forgot. So you, you, the question you asked. How tough was it to retire? It was, it was, it was. I missed the sport, of course I did, but it was enough was enough that I knew when my time would had come, and um, yeah, it just. I, I was, I had to go back and had a nine to five job like everybody else on planet Earth, to be honest, which I still do now. You know, I, I drove lorries, I've done all sorts. You name it, I've done all sorts. You know, I got, I got family, I got mouths to feed, bills to pay, like everybody on planet Earth. And uh, sadly, I achieved everything I wanted to achieve in, as, as, as a boxer. I was a British champion, intercontinental champion, world champion. The only thing perhaps I didn't achieve to make myself was financially stable, which is a disappointment, but listen, I'm, I'm blessed in life. I've got a lovely wife. I love her to death, me, me, me kids. I'm, I've, I'm, I'm blessed in life, to be honest. What I, what I don't have in financial value in life, I've, I'm a multimillionaire. And the last question for me, Glenn, something I ask a lot of fighters or ex-fighters, looking back on your career, what you've done, are you happy? There's things I would have changed if I could turn back the clock. And we'll leave it there, I won't say too much more, but there's certainly things I would have changed. Um, yeah, because my aim ultimately out of boxing was to become a champion, British champion, and ultimately a world champion. But the aim was to make myself financially stable, and sadly, that never happened. So there's things definitely that I would have changed. Well, Glenn, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. No problem at all.